Pleasure to announce Stephen Galbraith from the University of Auckland in New Zealand, who is talking about the same topic as before, namely about uh, discrete logarithms, but more precisely about pseudo random walks in cryptography. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Please use the mic for the for the audio. Really? Okay. We're being video streamed. Uh, being video streamed. Okay. It's your fault. <laughs> right. I'm Stephen Galbraith. I'm going to talk about. Uh, pseudo-random walks and algorithms for discrete logarithms and isogenies. There's going to be some kangaroos. This is supposed to be a picture of my daughter riding a kangaroo. Um, this is joint work with lots of people, um, students of mine and uh, people I've worked with. And there's some people I'd like to, to thank for um, sort of putting me on the right track. Tanya, Tanya put me on, the r on this track a long time ago. Um, Pierre Gaudry's given me a lot of advice. David Cole's given me a lot of advice. This is an advertisement for my book. If you want to learn about elliptic curve cryptography, this is the book for you. <laughs> um, and I am offering a genuine copy of this book, not a PDF, an actual cop copy of this book to the funniest rump session talk. So I hope there's at least one funny rump session talk. Uh, the outline is a little ambitious. Um, I'm very aware that it's lunchtime. Most, m most people consider this lunchtime already, so um, I'm aware I'm going to try not to keep you too long. But um, I'm going to talk about some uh, work on discrete log problem and variance of Pollard's algorithms. And uh, at this time, I'll talk a little bit about isogeny graphs. And you're welcome to interrupt and ask questions uh, if you need to. Very quickly, uh, just the notation, my group is always going to have order R. My discrete log problem is the same notation as previously. H is the, is the power of G. We already know they're exhaustive search, baby step, giant step. And uh, I'm kind of assuming you already know something about um, Pollard Row. <coughs> if you go to certain countries like Mexico, uh, you find all the streets are named after famous people. If you go to London, they're named after algorithms. Here you go, this is, this is a street in London, it's called Pollard Row. <laughs> okay, so what's the idea of random walk algorithms? The idea is, the, the Pollard's, uh, I guess the first idea is if you can find, I don't know if you can read this at the back, but g to the a1 times h to the b, uh, b1 equals g to the a2 times h to the b2. If you can find an equality like that, then you can rearrange and solve the discrete log problem. So the idea is you want to generate pseudo-random sequences, g to the sum power, h to the sum power. You want to generate these sequences, and what you want is a collision. A collision is um, two um, terms of, of the same sequence or two different sequences that are equal, because that's, that's what you're looking for. So we want collisions. And Pollard's idea was, uh, if you're looking for collisions and you don't want to use a lot of memory, of course you can find collisions by storing everything. You can compute lots of stuff, store everything, and then just look for collisions, that's easy. But Pollard wanted to get low storage algorithms, that's what I'm talking about. And the idea is to use pseudo-random walks where the next step is a function only of the current position. That's the big idea. So, you've, so you're, you're doing, you're, you're doing a, a walk, a random walk, or a pseudo-random walk in some set, and your next step depends only on where you're standing. And the point is that if you get a collision, then when you take one step, you still have a collision, and you take the two steps. So, so when things come together, they will then follow the same path. And then you don't have to store everything. You just store points now and then and you can check for collisions on these uh, so-called distinguished points. So that was, uh, that's, that's really the, the big idea in the talk, is to use these walks that only depend on the standing points. Well, there's been a lot of work. This was all started by Pollard in the 1970s, and Pollard came up with several algorithms, and subsequently there's been a lot of research and you can essentially cut these things into, into two halves. 
there's um, what I'm going to call the first type is where your steps and your elements of your walk are g to the something and h to the something, where both the powers are more or less random or are, are varying uh, a lot. And if you've got walks like that, then any collision is useful with high probability. So if you've got the first, if you've got the A's and the B's are always changing, then any collision is good. That's what's used in Pollard Row. There's a second type of situation. This is used in the kangaroo method. You have walks that are sometimes called tame walks, and the elements of those walks are g to the power something. And I should have said, but you, in the algorithm, you always know what these powers are. And then you have our wild walks, and wild walks are h times g to the something, where you know, where you know what the something is. And in this case, there's, there's one sort of collision that's good. You want, you want a, a, a tame and a wild colliding. Then you can solve your discrete log. But now there's useless collisions. If two tame things uh, match, well, you, you, you're, you don't get anything you didn't know. And if two wild things match, you, d you don't learn anything either. So you need these collisions of, of, um, of different types. Uh, so in this case, any collision is good. You analyze using the birthday paradox. In this case, only some conditions are good. Some collisions are good. Uh, you use different either variants of the birthday paradox or different things, different arguments in probability theory. This is probably a good time. Is there anyone who's got any questions? Okay. Uh, just a reminder of the birthday paradox. Sample a random from a set of size n. The expected number of trials until you draw the same element twice is root pi n over 2. So this is very well known, and this is the usual um, joke about how many people do you need in a room until two of them have the same birthday, would be um, about 24. Now here's a, here's a sort of tame wild birthday paradox. Now I'm sampling from a set of size n, so I'm, if you like I'm drawing numbers um, with replacement out of, a, out of an urn. And now I'm, uh, but I'm, but I'm writing them down either in one column or another column. So I'm kind of keeping a, keeping them in two different types or two different colors. And now, what's the number of trials until I've picked the same element twice, but put it in, in once in the one list and once in the other list? This becomes root pi n. So you've got a root two. You've got to do root two more work in this case. Uh, so, for example, if you've got a, a room with um, male and females in it of equal, of equal number of males and equal number of females, you need about 30, nearly 34 people um, would be the average number until you get to the same birthday. So this is what it comes in when you start doing this tame wild stuff. I got interested in some variants of the birthday paradox, and I came up with this puzzle. Some of you have seen this before. Uh, you imagine you're in a situation where there's a, there's a, there's a large pool of boys, and they're all born in January. And then there's a large pool of girls, and their birth dates are uniformly through the year. And you want to somehow find, for whatever reason, a boy and a girl with the same birthday. And so you want to sort of um, gather, gather them into some central area and, and, and ask them what their birthdays are until you get two of the same. The question is, should you be bringing in 12 times more boys than girls? Or should be, you be bringing in root 12 as many boys or girls? Or what's the ratio of boys to girls you should get to maximize this? So if you're, um, if you're feeling s sleepy or feeling bored, you can spend the rest of the talk working out what the optimal puzzle, uh, the optimal ratio of boys to girls is. Okay, so now I want to talk about the kangaroo algorithm of Pollard. So this is for a variant of the discrete log problem. You're given g and h, and you're also given a number n. And you're essentially told the discrete log, it's not, it's not arbitrary in the whole group. I mean, n here you think of as being smaller than the order of the group. And you're essentially told the discrete log lies between 0 and n. So n could be a lot smaller than, than the order of the group. This could be a really small interval. Um, or, uh, it comes up, supposedly. Who cares? Um, right, so the, uh, the, the Pollard method, of, I'll state the complexity. I'm going to prove this in the next slide. And uh, the key idea is, Pollard's idea is that uh, steps in the walk are short. So you have, you have your current step in your walk as g to the power of some a, what you know what that number is, and your next step, depending on where you're standing, you'll, you'll, you'll take a step to another element of your group, and that'll go from g to the ai to g to the ai plus 1, and your algorithm will know what these numbers are, 
And, and, and AI plus one is not much bigger than AI. AI plus one is about AI on average plus M, where M is called the mean step size. And this is going to be small compared to the length of the interval. This is Pollard's idea. So I'm, in the next slide, I'm going to explain a bit more precisely how we set up the algorithm. So this picture is um, somehow supposed to indicate what's going on. So, uh, so I think of this interval as being a as being a line. So I'm, I'm, I'm. My these are group elements, really, but I'm looking at g to the x, and I'm drawing the, the x's along the x-axis. So this is g to the zero, g to the one, g to the two, g to the three, right? So I'm, I'm representing the exponents as an interval. Uh, and I've got a, I've got my tame kangaroo starting here, starts in the middle of the interval, and it takes jumps of average size m, and it jumps along, and every now and then one of its group elements is distinguished, in which case it, it remembers something when it hits a distinguished point. So it jumps along like that. Now I've got my wild kangaroo, my wild kangaroo, oh, so these are called kangaroos because they, they take small jumps. Uh, my, my wild kangaroo starts at H. H is G to the A, so actually it starts at A. I, d I don't know where A is. And it takes jumps. I like to write them the other way. They're, they're, they're the same jumps, but I find it easier to draw the picture writing them the other way. So it takes, it takes some jumps as well, average length m. Now, at some point, as I'm about to explain, at some point we expect a collision. And then the whole point of these walks is the step of the walk only depends on where you're standing. So once you collide here, the next step will, of course, mirror the, the, the previous steps. So it doesn't matter. I don't have to store that point. I can just store there's a distinguished point over here. And the, when the tame kangaroo bounces along, it lands on that distinguished point and, and stores some information. And then later on, the wild kangaroo jumps along. There's a collision. It follows the path. And when we get to that distinguished point, uh, the discrete logarithm problem is solved. So let me uh, show you how you optimize the parameters for this algorithm. The parameter to be optimized is this number m. Tame kangaroo starts in the middle. So it starts at n over 2. So we've got 0. We've got n somewhere. This is n over 2. Uh, in this case, the tame one's in the front and the wild one's at the back. It could be the other way around. But either way, there's a, there's a front kangaroo and a, and a back kangaroo. There's a front kangaroo which starts more towards the right of the interval than the other one. In this case, the, 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 the wild kangaroo is starting in the first half of the interval, the tame kangaroo is starting in the middle. So what happens? The first thing that's got to happen is the rear one has got to catch up with the first one started. So there's going to be some, some number of steps where the rear one's catching up with the start. I don't know which is which. I'm just running both things together. Now, on average, this is n over 2. This is 0. So on average, you've got to go n over 4 distance. So on average, the distance between the rear and the front is n over 4. It might be n over 2. It might be 0. But on average, it's n over 4. And the steps are of distance m, on average. So it takes about n over 4m steps for the rear kangaroo to catch up to the where the front one started. OK, after that, what's happened? The tame one, or the front one's already been jumping. And it's basically, if you think of it, it's left footprints. It's left some footprints on the line. We don't see them, but they're, but they're there. It's, it's somehow, and about every, every m steps, it's left a footprint. The rear one comes along behind, and it's now jumping as well. And, and it's putting about one footprint in every space of length m as well. So if you sort of think of it, there's sort of, there's sort of, there's sort of little smudges on the floor about m apart. And I'm taking steps as well of about m apart. And sooner or later, I'm going to land on one of those smudges. And uh, it's a fairly standard thing in probability. You're waiting for an event to happen that happens with probability 1 over m. So after about m trials, you have a collision. So the running time of the algorithm is n over 4m steps on average for the rear to catch the front plus another m steps for the collision to occur. And then there's 1 over theta is just the extra time to the distinguished point. And there's a 2 on the front because both kangaroos have got to do this. We don't know which one's front and which one's back, so we just have to run them both until the algorithm stops. So that's the running time. And then you find that the best thing to do is to take n to be root n over 2. And um, you end up with this complexity of about 2 root n operations. So that's the, that's the, this is the Pollard kangaroo method in the Van Orschot Wiener formulation. And so this, this running time goes back to about 96.
Well, and that's sort of how it was. And um, uh, at some point, um, it was actually when I was writing my book, that um, I, I set as an exercise to um, show that you couldn't do um, something using inverses. And um, I sent my chapter of my book to John Pollard for him to give me suggestions. And he said, I don't like your exercise. I think it's wrong. And uh, anyway, the, the upshot was um, you can improve on this algorithm. And the, the basic idea, I don't have time to do all the details, but the basic idea is to start wild kangaroos. You have two wild kangaroos. You have a wild kangaroo starting at H. Well, first thing you do is you slide your interval so that it's centered on zero. So it goes from minus N over two to plus N over two. And then you start a wild kangaroo at H and another wild kangaroo at H inverse. So you now have three types of walks. You've got tame walks, wild walks, and inverse wild walks. They all go to the same direction. Uh, and the great thing is a collision between any of these walks wins. There's no bad, I mean, it's bad, I mean there's no bad collisions anymore. So if, if the tame and the wild collide, of course that works. If the tame one collides with the, the one from starting from the H inverse, that works as well. And if the if this one uh, collides with this one, everything works fine as long as you assume the group order is odd, which is okay. Um, and uh, so that's the three kangaroo method. And there's another another observation that means you should use four kangaroos, and you reproduce the analysis we just did, except something gets a lot more complicated. This plus m becomes a lot more complicated because there's 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 three different ways collisions can occur. So you have to do a, a, a more difficult probability argument here. And when it all boils down, you've turned your two root n algorithm into a 1.71 root n algorithm. And then there's another algorithm I'm going to tell you about in a minute, this Godry schost algorithm, uh, and you can get the running time down to 1.66. So this is a paper that's to appear in um, Mathematics of Computation, I think. But it's on the web. Right, so what's this Godry schost thing? What are these cockroaches? Um, let's check I'm doing for time. That's right, no, I do, I've, got a, I've got a countdown thing, but it uh, keeps... It's, it's, it's like you guys, my phone keeps going to sleep. It's, um, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so, yeah, maybe I should just back up. Pollard Rowe uses the birthday paradox. Pollard Kangaroo didn't use the birthday paradox. The, the, the whole the probability argument underlying the algorithm was that the, that thing about there's a footstep every m steps, and so after about m trials, I hit it. That's nothing to do with the birthday paradox at all. It's a completely different um, bit of probability being used. But Godry and Schost have an algorithm that is based on the birthday paradox, uh, but it can be used for things like the discrete log in, in an interval. So uh, I'm going to tell you sort of a sketch of how it works in this case of the interval. So in this case, you have a tame set, so some set of, some subset of your group, and a wild set. And you're going to have random walks that are going to be attempting to sample uniformly from T, and you're going to attempt to sample uniformly from W, and then you're hoping for a collision in the region where these sets intersect. Now, the random walks themselves are cockroaches. So cockroaches, the idea is they sort of, they sort of move around, but they, you know, they sort of go backwards and forwards or around. They originally proposed this as a two-dimensional thing, so they would sort of walk around the page. But they kind of stay in a locality. They don't just go off in one direction forever. They kind of stay somewhere close. So the idea is you get some kind of localized, um, localized sort of uniformish sampling. And if you sort of sprinkle enough cockroaches amongst your sets, they'll sort of, they'll sort of sample the, the, um, the set. Um, Right, so here's an example. So for the discrete log in an interval, the first thing you'd think of is you would take the tame set to be the interval. It's the g to the x, where x runs between 0 and n. So that's, that's the interval we're working in. And the wild set, well, I'm going to take that to be an interval of the same size, but centered on my unknown discrete log. So that's going to be h times g to the x, where x runs from minus n over 2 to, to plus n over 2. So if you, can, if you can picture it, I should have drawn a picture, but you've kind of got your interval, and then you've got your unknown discrete log somewhere, and you've, got a, and you've got another interval centered on that. And they overlap. They overlap to a certain amount. And they overlap. The best case scenario is where h is in the middle, and the intervals match perfectly. And the worst case scenario is h is at one end, and they overlap sort of, you know, the, the left half of one interval is the right half of the other. So the intersection is somewhere between n over 2 and n. 
So in this case, it's pretty simple. You just run this algorithm. You sample uniformly from T. You sample uniformly from W. And you apply the birthday paradox to the, to the region of intersection. And you're saying, I'm just sampling uniformly here, sampling uniformly here. Eventually, I'll get a collision. But it has to be one of these tame wild collisions. So it's the root pi n, um, not the root pi n over 2. And the, the, the bad thing is, of course, you don't know where the intersection of the two sets is. So you have to sample uniformly from the whole set. And, you, and so you're doing, a whole lot of, you're doing a whole lot of group operations that are outside the region of, of where the two sets intersect. So that kind of adds an overhead to the algorithm. So if you just do this, you end up with an algorithm worse than Pollard kangaroo. Bec and then the reason is because you're doing, well, this, this, well, there's several, well, anyway, yeah, there's several reasons. And partly it's because you've got this birthday paradox where you've got useless collisions, and partly because you're doing sampling outside the region you want to hit. And, and in terms of implementing this algorithm, it's really horrible because your, your cockroaches sometimes go off the end. Um, they, you, again, you have to have, remember the, 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 the fundamental axiom of Pollard. A random walk is a function of its position. So depending on where I'm standing, I just take a step. I can't tell my cockroach, oh, except for here, because you've hit the edge of your interval. Because the edge of one interval is not necessarily the edge of the other interval. So my cockroaches, they've got a rule that says I walk according to where I stand, and that means that sometimes they'll go off the end. And so you've got some kind of wasted, wasted steps there as well. So there's a, there's a, it's, it's a not a nice algorithm to implement. The good thing is you've got lots of choice over what these tame and wild sets are. So if you do the four kangaroo idea that I haven't really explained, and you somehow try and make these sets sort of smaller and funny shapes, um, you end up getting this uh, 1.66. So if, you, if you're interested to see how that works, you'll just have to read the paper. And then as I said here, in principle, this beats the, the four kangaroo method. So four cockroaches are better than four kangaroos. But uh, the, this word in principle here is because there's not much in it, right? This is, this is a um, point zero 0 0.05 difference in the constant. And in fact, the kangaroo method is really easy to implement, and it does kind of work nicely. And the, the, the cockroach method is, um, it's actually, it takes a lot of work to get a nice implementation. So in practice, I think you, you, you would actually use this algorithm. OK, so now for another, another topic. Yeah, so maybe, yeah, OK. So, uh, there's also this uh, well-known well -known thing for Pollard row is that you can consider equivalence classes of a group element and its inverse. This is like elliptic curves up to plus or minus. Um, and so it's, it's well known that you, can, that you can do this. This is uh, uh, Gallant Lambert Vanstone and Wiener Zuccarato. They showed how to use Pollard row on equivalence classes. And uh, in principle, you speed up the algorithm by a factor of root two. So it's natural to try and do something similar for the discrete log in an interval. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, and yeah, there are some there are some um, there are some inconveniences about using equivalence classes. And um, I'll gloss over the history, but anyway, you can look at this PKC paper that uh, explains that these in inconveniences are minor. Uh, but it's interesting that most uh, ECDLP records have not used this square root two speed up. Uh, so, I mean, uh, yeah, these inconveniences are sometimes inconvenient. Anyway, there's, it's still theoretically interesting to try and do the same thing for the discrete log problem in an interval. And you really can't do this with, with Quillard's kangaroo method. It just doesn't work. Basically, what you're doing in an equivalence class is you're, you're saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider g to the... g to the x and g to the, to the minus x as being the same. So we center our interval around zero again. And the problem is, if you, uh, how do you deal with equivalence classes? You determine a, a representative of each class. So each equivalence class has a unique representative. And, uh, and then you, you somehow, if you fall into a class, you move to the, to the representative, and then you carry on your walk. So if you try and use the kangaroo method, the kangaroo method is supposed to be bouncing along like this. But what happens if you do these equivalence classes, you bounce along and then you suddenly say, oh, I'm in the wrong class, I'm over here. And then you bounce along and then you say, no, I'm the right one, I'll go back over here. And when you sort of normalize that, you're, it's actually bouncing backwards and forwards on the same point. Because some of the times your, 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 your jumps on the inverse side that are going that way are equivalent to jumps on this side going back. So you end up doing a, a 
back front thing, and and your two kangaroos never meet. One of them, one of them is backwards and forwards over here, and one of them is backwards and forwards over here. They never meet. It just does, goes all wrong. So you can't. There's really no way, on a fundamental level, no way to do this trick with kangaroos. But it's no problem for Godri Shost. Godri Shost is just random walks on sets, and a set can be a set of equivalence classes. No problem. So you define your tame set to be a set of um, pairs, g to the x, g to the minus x. Uh, and then your wild set to be h times g to the x, and then the inverse of this thing. And um, you, you know how big your tame set is, and your wild set is, and you, you know that these things will intersect uh, in a certain, a certain region. Um, and you can sort of do the same thing, but, but some funny things start to happen. So the actual size of the intersection depends very much on the discrete log. Well, that was the same as before. But if you, um, if you try doing sampling, it turns out you're not actually, this is a bit subtle to explain, so I'm not going to try. You know, it turns out you, the, when you're sampling uh, by choosing random, by uniformly choosing x's, it's actually non-uniform sampling here. It's kind of some elements are sampled twice as often as others. So you, now, you, now you have this problem that you want to apply a birthday paradox, and you've actually got non-uniform sampling in one of the sets. And that's... You have to go away and say, how do I do the birthday paradox with non-uniform sampling? Okay, luckily there was a paper of Sir Levinov that does this. This is just some paper on some journal of probability from the 1970s, or maybe 80s. Um, anyway, and then, then for some other applications and some more work, it turned out even that wasn't enough. And so I collaborated with a friend of mine, Mark Holmes, who, um, who's a probability theorist, and we had this generalization of the birthday paradox. And um, it's fairly horrible. Um, but this answers the puzzle. Uh, but I think I might not go over that. Um, anyway, all you need to know is there's some, there's some general purpose tool for birthday paradoxes that's, that's more, general than, um, more general than anyone probably needs. And you just get some formula for some expectation until a collision, which is of the usual kind of form. Right, so uh, with my student Ramanda Ruprai, we um, worked out how to do the discrete log in an interval when using equivalence classes under inversion. So it is only of interest if your inversion is fast. So this is fine for elliptic curves, uh, discrete logs. Um, and you get, of course, because you're doing equivalence classes, there's going to be issues with cycles, and so we just, we just sort of um, forget that. So you could, you, that's sort of hidden, this little O1 this kind of optimistic assumption that we can put all that in the little low one. Uh, a realistic assumption. And uh, so the running time is 1.36. So if you remember the, the, the previous, would have the, the, in, in the 1990s, the thing was 2 root n. We got that down to 1.66 root n. And you get that down to 1.36 root n if you've got um, plus or minus equivalence classes. I don't know what this means. I I'm, I'm, I'm was revising old slides I used in Montreal. And in Montreal, I said, possibly this can be improved. And now I actually haven't the faintest idea, but uh, it's, the statement could still be true. I don't know. It's probably, it probably can be improved, but I don't remember what I was thinking when I wrote that previously. OK. Yeah, so the original godri schost is about what's called a two-dimensional discrete log. So now we've, we've, got, a, we've got a big group. And we've got two elements now, G1 and G2 in our group, that are kind of just randomly chosen group elements. And I've got an, an element H in my group that's G1 to the power A1 times G2 to the power A2. And now A1 and A2 are both small. So this still may not be, this, this, I mean, the group itself may be cyclic. I'm not necessarily, I may or may not be talking about a non-cyclic group here. But this could make sense even in a cyclic group. But, but the order of the group could still be much bigger than n1 times n2. So if you like, I'm still generating some, some small subset of a group by taking small powers of g1 times small powers of g2. So one can consider a discrete log problem of this shape. And this has applications. So Godry and Schost were getting these from, from point counting on hyperelliptic curves. But there's, all, there's various things in the literature which boil down to this. Uh, so again, you've got obvious baby step, giant step um, type algorithms for this, but the question is to get a low memory algorithm. And so um, 
Gojri Shost give that, and we refined their method to improve their method to, to get a better running time, uh, whatever. But uh, then I had a student, a master's student called uh, Wei Lu. This was in Auckland. And uh, I set her the challenge of doing this two-dimensional thing with equivalence classes. And I was particularly interested in an application where um, G2 is actually an endomorphism applied to G1. So, so G1 would be an elliptic curve point, and G2 would be, would be phi of, of G1, where phi is one of these endomorphisms you use in the GLV method. And, um, and you would have uh, equivalence classes where you could... Um, where you could sort of apply phi again, and you'd sort of you'd, you'd get you'd get h, and you get phi of h, and you get phi square of h, and f and, and uh, you'd end up with equivalence classes of size four by kind of acting by phi. So I was interested in, in what you could do for the discrete log in this situation. So it's a kind of a two-dimensional thing with a with a degree four automorphism acting on it. So that's what happened here. This was what she was doing in her master's thesis, and. Um, we, uh, yeah, so we got the 2.36 down to 1.03 in that case. But this, this was actually, this, this took um, um, s s quite some uh, tedious, um, miserable work, which is why I gave it to a master's student. Uh, anyway, so if you're interested in these things, her thesis is on my webpage. Right, this was the next thing I was going to talk about today was isogeny graph. So this is going to be another example of... Um, an application of pseudo-random walks in, well, not really cryptography, but maybe some questions that are interesting for people who are interested in curves over finite fields. So what's an isogeny? So if, I, if I've got elliptic curves over a finite field, an isogeny is basically a group homomorphism. It's a map that's a sort of an, an algebraic map and a geometric map at the same time. So if you know what this is, you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, just think of it as group homomorphism from one elliptic curve to a different one with a finite kernel. And what you can do with isogenies, of course, is you can take a discrete log problem. It's a group homomorphism with a small kernel. So you can take an, a, a discrete log instance on this curve and move it to a discrete log instance on the other curve. And you know, maybe, maybe it's easier to solve the discrete log on this curve than, than, than that one. Or maybe it's not, or maybe you're trying to prove that all curves have the same kind of hardness of discrete log, or whatever. But anyway, the fact that you can move discrete logs among curves by our isogenies has been used um, in, in lots of ways. It's been used uh, to, to extend the range of a certain special attacks, and it's been used to um, make arguments. Um, even even uh, since, since Neil's here, even a, even a, a, a potentially perverse argument about uh, the hardness of a certain pairing-friendly curve. But uh, anyway, we... Uh, Isogeny is used all the time to argue in all sorts of different ways. Uh, basic fact, if two curves have the same number of points, there's an isogeny between them. So a very natural question is, given two curves with the same number of points, can you construct an isogeny between them? And this is a problem I was interested in uh, a long time ago. Um, and uh, there's a hash function. This is the Charles Goren Lauter hash function. Very nice idea. And um, you want to, um, basically, the, 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 ha you, the hash input is a binary string, and that decides your path through some, through some graph. And uh, the output is a, is a J invariant of an elliptic curve. And it's not so much finding collisions, finding pre-images. If you want to find pre-images, you're basically solving this isogeny problem. You've got, you've got the starting curve, and you've got the hash value, and the... the, 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 the the, 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 the thing that was hashed is the isogeny between them, or is equivalent to that. Uh, yes, and there's other applications of isogenies. Uh, I guess Drew will talk about some of them. And he's got a nice paper in the ANTS Proceedings. Um, Everett Howe, et al. editors of the ANTS Proceedings, um, if you want to learn more about isogenies and applications. So where did the random walks come in? So what we do is we think of, if we're studying isogenies, we translate this into a language of graph theory. We, we take L be a set of primes. These are going to be the isogeny degrees that we're considering. And we define a graph whose vertices are the isomorphism classes of elliptic curves that are isogenous to E. 
So I've got all my elliptic curves isogenous to E. Each, is, each isomorphism class of such elliptic curves is a, is a vertex in my graph, and the edges are these L isogenies. So associated to an isogeny is its degree, and I consider isogenies of prime degree. And the size of my graph I'm going to call capital N. Uh, so, uh, back in the 90s, I gave an algorithm to compute an isogeny between two curves, but this was not a low memory algorithm. This, is a, this was just a big hungry algorithm that you've got, a, you've got a, a vertex in your graph here, and you've got a vertex in your graph here, and you want to somehow find a path between them, and what you do is you just grow out a whole bunch of, sort of, just to build out a tree from, from one end, and you build out a tree from the other end, and you store everything, and at some point these trees come together, and uh, you find your path. And the, m much more recently, I'm embarrassed to say I never really bothered to look, but this is an algorithm from 1969 due to Pohl, um, and I probably should have cited that in my paper. Uh, and they call it a uh, bidirectional search. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, this is a, this is if, if you forget about problems with, with the conductor, whatever that is, you're solving the isogeny problem in, in root n time. That's fine, but this is a large, this is like baby step, giant step. This is, this is a square root type algorithm with square root storage. You want to get a low storage algorithm. You want to get an algorithm that can be parallelized. So together with um, Florian Hess and Nigel Smart, we came up with a algorithm for the isogeny problem for, for ordinary elliptic curves. And it used random walk, so that's why I'm talking about it now. It's a random walk type algorithm. You, you, you still think of this thing as a graph, and you randomly walk around this graph, and certain vertices are distinguished points. So when you hit a distinguished point, you, you, you remember something, and then you carry on walking, and you have, you have random walks coming out from, from, from one of your vertices, and you have random walks coming out from, from your, other, your other vertex, and eventually these random walks um, visit the same distinguished point, and you can trace an isogeny. Um, back through. So it's, again, it's exactly this um, second type of walk. You've got walks coming from one side, you could call them the tame ones, and walks coming from another side, you're calling them the wild ones, and when the tame and the wild collide, you've got a path through the graph. So that's what I'm saying here. Analyze using the birthday paradox. Um, actually, actually, we, uh, we made an embarrassing mistake, and uh, Anton Stolbunov um, politely drew that to my attention, uh, but he also had some uh, really nice uh, tricks. Basically, uh, there's a, there's a, you should really think of this as a weighted graph. Some of these edges are faster to go down than other edges. There's sort of fast, fast edges and slow edges. And, and what's the speed? Well, it depends on the degree of the isogeny. It's faster to compute a low degree isogeny than to compute a high degree isogeny. So you should really sort of take, take the fast roads wherever you can, but if you take the fast road too often, your walk's not very random. So there's some kind of balancing act about getting a walk that still somehow looks random enough that you can, with, with honesty, appeal to the birthday paradox, but that uses the fast roads as often as possible. So um, Anton and I have got a paper on that. That's also on my web page. And one interesting thing that came out of this work, right from the original thing, was that you end up generating a very long, you're doing pseudo-random walks, they're very long, and you end up with a very long path through this graph. But there is a much, these graphs actually have small diameter. This is, there, there exists a much shorter path. So somehow you've found this long one and you want to somehow turn that into a short one. And this was, um, uh, so yeah, again, if you'll know this if you're an expert, uh, a path in the ordinary isogeny graph corresponds to an ideal class. Well, the path corresponds to an ideal, and the, the ideal class, any other ideal in that class corresponds to an isogeny. So you somehow want to find in an ideal class a nicer, um, a nicer ideal. So we used um, some ideas that were well known to smooth ideals. Some other people have done some um, similar stuff. Uh, and I also wanted to mention this um, very nice algorithm since Gaetan and, and Drew are both here. Very nice algorithm due to Bisson and Sutherland that um, is also a, a, a different approach to finding um, it's, it's, it's exponential rather than sub-exponential. But it's a really nice way to control the sort of uh, niceness of the, of the isogeny you get. So if you don't know that paper, you should look at it. It's called a prototype algorithm for finding a short product below. Blah, blah, blah. There you go. Uh, now I've got very recently more interested in the super singular case again, um, and this is partly because of the the hash function, uh, and it's of a very different flavour. 
So what is a super singular curve? A super singular curve, its number of points is 1 mod p. And there's lots of things known about super singular curves. The J invariants all lie in Fp squared. And the graph is connected by isogenies of a single degree, which is usually not tr the case uh, in general. So I can define a graph whose vertices are isomorphism classes of super singular curves. So I can label them with J invariants. And edges are L isogenies for uh, primes L in my set, uh, which might just be two isogenies. And I know that there's about P over 12 super singular curves. And I know that the graph's connected with isogenies of a single degree, in which case it's a three regular graph. And again, you can do this um, bidirectional poles algorithm, solve the isogeny, no problem, and square root time and square root storage. Now, the easiest thing, it's, it's completely straightforward if you've been playing this game, to think about doing random walks and to try to get a low storage algorithm. But it's, uh, there's a big problem with small cycles. The problem is you're in a three regular graph. At each vertex, you have to choose one of the three directions to go in. So, okay, so you go. You, you, you go along from this vertex to this vertex. Now, this vertex, you now forget everything. Your walk function depends on where you're standing. And you've got a one-third chance that you're going to go straight back to where you were. So you've got two cycles, and you've got lots more complicated cycles. The next slide is supposed to, this is, represents a, 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 a complicated three-cycle. You can't even see it. It doesn't really matter. And this is a complicated four-cycle. But there are things that even if you try and do quite sophisticated look-ahead, um, this is, this is, these, these are things that even a quite sophisticated look ahead algorithm gets caught in a four cycle um, because you're in a three regular graph and you just don't have many choices. So um, this is work I was doing with Chang and Zhao um, and it's sort of still ongoing which means neither of us are doing anything. Uh, uh, so what I've been doing very recently, really just in the last couple of weeks, is I've been thinking about a different graph now, a super singular graph where I'm interested in just the elliptic curves that are defined over Fp. So most super singular curves are defined over Fp squared. I'm interested in super singular curves defined over Fp. Uh, so I'm a bit vague here, but I'm going to take isomorphism, Fp isomorphism classes of super singular elliptic curves over Fp. And um, Again, edges, I'm going to take some set of primes, and I'm going to take edges in the graph to be corresponding to these primes. Now, the great thing is if E is a super singular curve over Fp, then it has P plus 1 points, and so its characteristic polynomial is T squared plus P equals 0, and so Frobenius acts, uh, Frobenius is, is like square root minus P. So the end of orthism ring contains square root minus P. And then you can just do Doring lifting, uh, and you can identify all such super singular curves with curves in characteristic zero, whose endomorphism ring is either z root minus p, or if this is possible, uh, z1 plus root minus p over 2. Um, so you've got some set of super singular curves, of isomorphism classes of super singular curves over Fp, and you can basically um, think of these things as being ideal classes in, in, in this or this ring. And... Um, uh, it basically becomes like the ordinary case again. So, so the isogeny graph is a volcano. So a volcano is basically a, something with layers. So you have some kind of um, circle, and then you have some edges going down. And, and uh, um, so, uh, so if if p is uh, three mod four, uh, these ones correspond to the crater, and these ones correspond to the sort of the ground level. And if 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 p is not if p is one mod four, then then the, the volcano is actually. Um, a volcanic lake, I guess. Uh, it's just flat. Uh, right, and you know how many of these things there are. They're just given by class numbers. Um, there's a little uh, trick here if you're doing these kind of uh, graphs. Um, you really don't label these graphs as J invariants. You have to label them with a little bit more information to, get the, to see the structure right. Anyway, so the isogeny, the isogeny problem for elliptic curves over Fp is actually very simple. It's very simple to get a low memory algorithm. It's just the, the Galbraith S smart algorithm again. So um, this is what a student uh, from Oldenburg by the name of Christina Delfs is, um, I hope, working busily in Auckland on her computer right now, um, implementing all this stuff for me. Uh, oh, I think I've just, I've, I basically was ahead of myself. So you can do a low storage algorithm and it all seems to work fine. Right, so this is joint work with Christina. 
Excellent. I think that's about all I'm going to say. Yes. So uh, we can get lunch. Uh, what have we learned? We've learned that these pseudo-random walks are very valuable for getting low storage algorithms. And I haven't talked much about parallel, parallel computing or distributing over the internet, but all these algorithms can be distributed over the internet, which makes them feasible. Uh, so discrete logs, various types of discrete log problem, isogeny problems, these can be done. This Godri Shost thing is a really good idea. This, is, this was sort of, I think, um, not very well known. Probably still isn't very well known, but it's actually a, it's actually a powerful tool. So, so it should be better known than it is. Um, we've used it in several ways. And uh, with Mark Holmes, we've got this generalized birthday paradox that's helpful if you're doing these kind of algorithms. So there you go. There's some volcanoes. That's Popocatapetl, which I didn't see because of the smog. And this is a also volcano-like thing that I didn't see. Um, so I thank the organizers, and I thank you for your attention. Thanks to Stephen. Other questions? I've got a question. What's the answer to the puzzle? <laughs> the question was, what is the answer to the puzzle? No questions about how many cockroaches you need to beat a kangaroo? Okay, I think the audience is just hungry. Um, What's the answer to the puzzle? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> yes, so the question is how many you've got boys and girls. You've got boys and girls. You've got a, you've got a, you've got a bunch of boys. All their birthdays are in January. Uniformly, the, the birthdays are uniformly sampled from the month of January. A bunch of girls whose Birthdays are uniformly sampled through the whole year. You want to bring some number of girls into the room, some number of boys into the room, and uh, well, what's the expected number of boys and girls you have to bring into the room until you end up with a boy and a girl with the same birthday. So the, the temptation is to think that you would take 12 times more girls than boys because, like, you know, there's only one in 12 girls has a birthday in January, right? So it seems like you'd have to have 12 times more girls than boys um, to, to maximize this. But that would be the wrong thing to do as can be easily seen from this theorem. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, so the answer is one to one. You take at least, well, uh, slight catch. Okay, for the actual numbers 12 and 365, you take, I think, about 60% um, girls and 40% boys. But as, as, as the number of days in a year tends to infinity, where January is 1 12th of the days in the year, the answer is one to one. Before we get to lunch, I think we should get some instructions of not two random walks for finding lunch. <laughs>